So here we're continuing exercise 20.42. We're starting here with E. Remember the goal here, the instructions for this exercise, were that we couldn't use, we, we had to make this molecule that they give us, but our only limitation was that we could not uh, use a molecule that had more than two carbons on it, unless it was a Wittig reaction. In, the, in that case, we still couldn't use a carbon molecule that has two carbons on it unless it was the triphenylphosphine, right? If we have the phosphorus, those benzene rings have more than two carbons, we can use this. But the carbon that's bonded to it can't have more than two carbons on it. So that's our big restriction in this one. We're trying to do a synthesis. We can use any compounds we want. Our goal is to make this molecule that they give us from anything we want, just so long as it doesn't have more than two carbons. So our first step is to take the carbon backbone, the carbon chain here, and break it up into the largest chunks we can, two carbons. So one, two, all right, that's as big as we can use. Then one, two, and again, as big as we can use. So we end up with sort of three pieces separated by those breaks. We end up with this first piece on the left, just two carbons there, we end up with this piece in the middle, two carbons there, and I'm going to include this double bond to the nitrogen, which is single bonded to an OH. We'll talk about that. And then this last piece on the very end just has one carbon. It's basically a CH3. So those are our three pieces. Now we do have to fit them back together. These that we broke them apart because we can't work we can't start with more than two carbons, but we want to put them together to get this final molecule. And you, which means we're going to be making some carbon-to-carbon -carbon bonds. We want to car bond this carbon to that one, for example. We want to bond this carbon to this one, for example. And the carbon-carbon bonds we make are going to be single bonds, right? We want this bond to be a single or sigma bond. We want this bond to be a single or sigma bond. And the way that you make a carbon-to-carbon -carbon sigma bond is with a Grignard reagent. Now the molecules that only have hydrogen and carbon on them, those are the perfect ones to make your Grignard reagent out of, because all a Grignard reagent needs is a nucleophilic carbon. Now, if you had something like this, that was just ethane, you could put a bromine on it by doing some radical reaction. Remember, the only, the only reaction that you can really do with an alkane, aside from burning it in oxygen to get carbon dioxide and water and heat, is a radical reaction. So you could do something like NBS and light, and that would end up making bromoethane. And then you can plop some solid magnesium into that, and that will give you your Grignard reagent. So we can turn that into a Grignard reagent. And we know we'd want to because it just has carbon and hydrogen on it. So the most use we can make out of that is a Grignard. And the similar thing goes for this carbon over here. Let's say you had methane, so CH4, simplest organic molecule that exists. You can do the same thing, NBS and light, and that would give you bromomethane. And again, plop some solid magnesium into that, and that gives you CH3Mg. Br. And I'm making sure to write the carbon next to the magnesium because that's the bond. Those are bond that's what magnesium is bonded to, that carbon there, to create the carbon nucleophile. So those are our pieces. Now, in order to connect those pieces to this middle piece, we're going to need two electrophilic centers. We're going to need an electrophilic center at that carbon that's double bonded to the nitrogen, and an electrophilic center on the other carbon. After all, that is what's going to make this nucleophilic carbon attack here and this nucleophilic carbon attack there. They have to be electrophiles. So how can we efficiently have make two neighboring carbons electrophiles at the same time? An epoxide. Having that oxygen there, one oxygen steals electrons from two carbons and makes them both electrophilic. Now, as of right now, we haven't seen how this connects with what we want here, but that is the way we can create the carbon chains. And once we have the carbon chain connected, then we can worry about the functional groups.
Okay, so let's connect these carbon chains. Now, ultimately, we want this functional group facing this molecule. So we're going to react these other two first. And we'll see why in a second. Let's take the oxirane, that smallest of epoxides, and react it with our methyl magnesium bromide. Hmm. Now, remember, this effectively acts as a ionic bond. So the magnesium has a plus charge. Carbon here has a negative charge, the two electrons, uh, the one from the carbon and the other from the magnesium, both go to the more electronegative place, the carbon. That carbon now has that full negative charge, which is nucleophilic, and that attacks the slightly positive charges on this oxirane. So this negative charge swoops in and attacks that carbon there. That breaks the ring. The ring strain was, burst, was itching to burst open anyway, and when it gets that push from the methyl group, this one of these bonds breaks open, and we end up with our two original carbons, but with a third one attached. Now notice the oxygen is going to be on carbon number one. This had two lone pairs, now it has three and a full negative charge. So this is carbon one and two. Off of carbon two is going to be another methyl group. That is our Grignard. That's attached. So that's our third carbon there. Now remember, after you do a Grignard, it's always a good step to add some water. That will stabilize the negative charge that you create on that oxygen. So now we have this. The oxygen steals the hydrogen from water and gives you that. Okay, well, we had another Grignard reagent that we were going to use to connect this to get our full carbon chain. But this Grignard reagent is an electrophile, right? Full negative charge there, and then the magnesium bromide with the positive charge. So that's, uh, I'm sorry, that the Grignard region is a nucleophile, strong nucleophile, but it needs an electrophile in this molecule to attack. Now we don't have the strongest electrophile just yet, but we do have an alcohol, and we know that a carbonyl carbon is an awesome electrophile, and we could turn that in to a carbonyl carbon by just making one extra bond to an oxygen. Now notice what kind of alcohol we have. The carbon that has the OH on it, that carbon is only bonded to one other carbon, so it's primary. Ah, but when you have a primary carbon and you want to oxidize it to an aldehyde, and notice this is an aldehyde, you have a carbon double bond to an oxygen with a hydrogen on one side. This carbon only has three bonds explicitly drawn. The other bond, the implied bond, is a hydrogen. Hydrogen is the, the it's only bonds to hydrogen that can be implied. Bonds to anything else have to be drawn explicitly. So if a bond is missing, there's no formal charge, so you know it's there, it has to be to a hydrogen. Well, to turn a primary alcohol into an aldehyde, you have to use a weak oxidizing agent like pyridinium chlorochromate, PCC. So we've seen that before. Once you have PCC, you have an incredible electrophile. That carbon is losing electrons to the oxygen twice over, plus the pi electrons are act as a good leaving group. It's easy to break the pi bond. So the Grignard reagent swoops in, attacks the carbonyl carbon, the pi electrons get bumped up, they, they ricochet back onto the oxygen above them. And now, let's just detract these, let's keep it in number, one, two, three, four, five, so we're going to want a five carbon chain, so one, two, three, four, five, And we're now going to have an oxygen here with just a single bond on carbon number three. That oxygen had two lone pairs. After it receives the pi electrons, it'll have three. That gives it a full negative charge. After you do a Grignard reaction, it's good form. Add water to stabilize your molecule. It'll steal a hydrogen from the water. And that really exists in an equilibrium, but... Okay, so... We have our carbon chain, five carbons. That We definitely wanted that, right? We had a total in the beginning of five carbons. One, oops, one, two, three, four, five. And we have an OH on carbon number three. 
So let's compare what we have with what we want. This is what we have right now. What we want is a five carbon chain, so we've already achieved that, but we want a double bond to a nitrogen, which also has an OH on it. Well, this should look a lot to you like an imine. Now, technically, this is not an imine, but it's something very similar. If it were just an R group here, it would, it would indeed be an imine, because you have an OH there. This is called not an imine, but an oxime. So that's where you have this nitrogen version of a carbonyl, nitrogen double bonded to a carbon, and the, th the other thing the nitrogen is bonded to is an OH. That's an oxime. Now, you don't need to know that name for our class, but I'm telling you because hopefully it'll make you lead a richer life knowing that that's called an oxime. All right, well, an oxime, f an oxime forms in basically the same way as an imine does. You just need a carbonyl. So we'll turn this into a carbonyl. This is a secondary alcohol. Notice this carbon is bonded to one, two other carbons. So it's secondary to oxidize a secondary alcohol. You can use a strong oxidizing agent like sodium dichromate in water and sulfuric acid. Oops. And that gives you your ketone. And to get the oxime, it's very similar as what you would need in order to form an imine. The two bonds to between the nitrogen and the carbon, those are replacing bonds that were to hydrogen on the nitrogen. That's common. Think back to the mechanism for imine formation. It's the proton transfers off of that nitrogen that allow you to form those two bonds. So those two bonds to the hydrogens end up forming the double bond to the carbon of the oxime. And the third thing, well, if you need it to be an OH in the final product, just make it an OH in the original thing. And this is called a hydroxylamine. Again, not a name you te technically need to know, but while we're studying it, you might as well be exposed to it. So if you ever do need to know it, it'll echo somewhere in your mind, having seen this now. So hydroxylamine. That should make sense. A hydroxyl group is an OH, right? That's hydroxide by itself. If it's a branch, it's hydroxyl. Hydra for hydrogen, ox for oxygen. So hydroxyl. And then we know that an amine is any nitrogen that has all single bonds all around it, which this has. So if you take a hydroxyl amine and you add it to a ketone, you end up getting this oxime. The reaction conditions are really similar. In addition to the hydroxyl amine, you should include some catalytic acid. And if you can do some dehydration so that in the, you're removing water from the reaction vessel, that'll push the equilibrium toward the formation of the oxime through Le Chatelier's principle. And that is all you need to do. That is our product. That's what we wanted. So to recap what we did, first we'll recap conceptually, and then I'll just write out the reagents we used. To recap what we did, we knew we couldn't use anything that had more than two carbons. So we chopped up this molecule into two carbon bits. We looked at the separate pieces. Any pieces that were just hydrocarbons, we turned into Grignard reagents. The stuff in the middle, that had to serve as the electrophile, or I should say the stuff that had more than carbon and hydrogen on it, that had to serve as an electrophile for the Grignard reagents to attack. So we had the Grignard reagents attack, and specifically, we had this one attack first, and the reason for that is because when this attacks first, the oxygen goes away from it. So notice you have your Grignard reagent here, and it's on the opposite carbon that the oxygen is. Well, the oxygen ultimately turns into our other electrophile, so that's where we want the MGBR to go. So, because we wanted this functional group to exist away from the carbon where the methyl group attached, we want the methyl group to attack first so that the oxygen, which becomes that functional group, gets pushed away from this incoming methyl group. So we had that. We eased the negative charge on that molecule with some water. 
do a proton transfer, then we oxidize that primary alcohol into an aldehyde in order to turn it into a better electrophile for our other Grignard reagent, our other carbon nucleophile to attack. Once that attacked, again, we have the negative, unstable negative charge, which we stabilize by adding water. Now, we compared the molecule we were left with, this 3-pentanol. We compared that alcohol with the reaction we, with the molecule we wanted, which was an oxime. And we noticed, noticed that the oxime is really like an imine. It forms in the same way. With a nitrogen that has two hydrogens, it just has an OH instead of an R group. So it's a hydroxylamine instead of just a regular amine. But in order to do that reaction to form the oxime, or if you want to think of it, the imine-like thing, you need a ketone. And we had an aldehyde, so we had, or sorry, we had a, an alcohol. So we had to do an oxidation. And because the alcohol was on a secondary carbon, we used a strong oxidizing agent like sodium dichromate in aqueous acid. Once we had that ketone, we reacted with the oxime in acid catalyst, with an acid catalyst, and removing water to help shift the equilibrium for better yields. And that gives us our hydroxylamine, what we wanted. So we started out, just to list it all again, we started out with oxirane, that simplest of epoxides. We treated that first with methyl magnesium bromide. Remember that ME is the CH3 group. Now, after that, we had a negative oxygen that we had to stabilize with water through a proton transfer. Then, we oxidized the alcohol that we have, that we formed in those two steps, to an aldehyde with PCC. That allows us to have a good electrophile to attract the other Grignard reagent, which we saw was ethyl magnesium bromide. Once that's attached, we follow that Grignard reaction up with water so the oxygen doesn't have a negative charge. Then we oxidize that alcohol to get a ketone, yet again, to form a good electrophile. We can see how useful having that strong carbonyl-carbon electrophile is, how, how many reactions it opens up to us. So we, because it was, at this point we had a secondary alcohol, we were able to treat this with a strong oxidizing agent, like sodium dichromate in water and sulfuric acid. And once we had that, we just needed, we could create the oxime by reacting the ketone that we have at this point with the hydroxylamine. To improve our yield, of course, we needed catalytic acid, like with all of the acetal and imine and enamine formations. And then we removed, so that's a minus sign, some water. And that helps because water is a product. When you remove a product in an equilibrium, you shift the equilibrium toward the products you end up making more product and you get a higher yield. That's using Le Chatelier's principle, as we've discussed previously. And so that seven-step process is how you can start with oxirane and make this oxime work of art. All right, let's try F. Similar thing, actually. We, we notice, you walk along it, it's really almost the same, except we have a different group. Instead of an, uh, an oxime, we just have an alkene. But okay, we know the same rule as before. No more than two carbons in your branch. So one, two, break. One, two, break. So those are our biggest pieces. Let's include those breaks and organize the three pieces we have. So we have one on the left, one in the middle, and one carbon on the right. Very, very similar to what we had before. In fact, we can go through the same steps very quickly to produce the ketone that we had before in the, in the, in the previous one, E. Because notice what we can do. If we had that ketone that we made in the previous exercise, well, all we need to do is replace the oxygen with this carbon form a new carbon-to-carbon -carbon bond, and notice that it's a carbon-to-carbon -carbon double bond. Well, that should stand out like flashing lights. That's a Wittig reaction right there. We just have to do a Wittig reaction. We can turn this ketone into this. Well, that saves us a lot of thought. We know that we can turn these, these 
hydrocarbons into Grignards. Right, the things that only have hydrogen and carbon in them, that don't have weird other available chemistry, those really are most useful as carbon nucleophiles, in other words, Grignard reagents. So for example, if you had ethane, you could treat it with NBS and light, and that would put a bromine on there, so we have bromoethane, or one bromoethane if you prefer. Um, and once you have that, you can hock some magnesium in there, creates your Grignard. So ethyl magnesium bromide now. We do a similar thing here. Treat that with NBS and light. Oops. And bromosuccinamide and light. And we get bromomethane. Lob some magnesium into that. And we end up with methyl magnesium bromide. So we have those Grignard reagents. And we can do similar steps as we did, almost the same exact steps as we did in the last one to get this keto, 3-pentanone. We treat that with our first methyl magnesium bromide. And just like before, the carbon nucleophile attacks that M ME is really a CH3, but it's a nucleophile. It attacks the slightly positive carbon here, breaks open the ring, we end up with the new methyl group attached down there, the oxygen up here flailing in the wind with a negative charge. We stabilize it with water. Now, we want to react that with our other Grignard. To do that, we turn it into a better electrophile by oxidizing it. It's a primary alcohol. The carbon that has the OH on it is only bonded to one other carbon, so it's a primary alcohol. We want to get it just into a carbonyl, so it's an aldehyde. Turn an alcohol into an aldehyde by using a weak oxidizing agent like pyridinium chlorochromate, PCC. At this point, we're ready to attach our other carbon chain, ethyl magnesium bromide. The carbon there attacks the carbonyl. The pi bond breaks. The electrons ricochet onto the oxygen on top. And now, keeping track of the carbons, we have one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Notice, carbonyl, or the oxygen, is on carbon number three. It only has one oxygen there, full negative charge, flapping in the wind. So we stabilize it by treating it with water. It snatches one of the hydrogens from water and turns into an alcohol. Well, we're almost at the ketone that we wanted. We oxidize it. This is a secondary alcohol. The carbon that has the OH on it is bonded to one, two other carbons, so it's secondary. Secondary alcohol, you don't need to be gentle with. You can treat it with a strong oxidizing agent like sodium dichromate, Na2Cr2O7, in water and sulfuric acid. That turns the alcohol into a ketone. And now, we're where we want it to be. Now, this is the same process we did in the previous step, which is why I flew through this. Because if you want to see step-by-step -step careful reasoning for it, well, that's what we did in the previous problem. Notice in the previous problem, we ended up synthesizing the same ketone using the same steps. And the only difference would be this last step. Now, we don't want to make an oxine, nitrogen double bonded to carbon with an OH hanging off. Now, we want to make an alkene. We want a carbon-to-carbon -carbon double bond, the signature of a Wittig reagent. Well, what we want here to add is a carbon with a CH3 on one side. That's what that is. It has another hydrogen on the other side. Remember that we need two things to do the Wittig reaction. We need a ketone, check. We need a Wittig reagent, the phosphorus ilid, carbon double bonded to phosphorus that has three phenyl groups on it, benzene rings acting as branches. Mm, and we combine this with our ketone, and that gives us our product. And that's the product they wanted us to make. That's the product they gave us here. So we cut, we saw, we, we
cut the pe we know that our one restriction in this problem and it's a useful lesson i guess for life in general being restricted gives you direction when you have infinite choices you first of all it opens you up to to the, the possibility the worry that you've made the wrong choice um, and it also is daunting to, to make a choice I guess that's true in life. It's definitely true in organic chemistry. When you're trying to figure out a synthesis, your limitations are actually the things that help you most because they narrow down what you can do and they make it easier to make a decision about what steps to take. So here, here, we knew that we our limitation was we could have no more than two carbons, so we chopped this up. We scissored it into pieces that were only made of two carbons. The end, the middle, the end. The things that only had hydrocarbons, alkanes, all single bonds, we turned those into Grignard reagents. And the thing that in the middle that was weird, that had a, a functional group or a feature of extra electrons, like the alkene, we knew that we would make that the electrophile that the, the Grignard reagents would attack. So we used, we knew we need, needed to attach nucleophiles on both of these carbons here. And so efficiency, we made both of those carbons electrophiles by using oxirane, that smallest of epoxides, simplest of epoxides. We reacted our first Grignard reagent with it, opened it up, popped open the ring, and then to stabilize the negative charge, we treat it with water. That gives us an alcohol. But we need another good electrophile, so we oxidize the alcohol to an aldehyde with a weak oxidizing agent like pyridinium chlorochromate, PCC. Now that we have a good Electrophile, we react it with a Grignard reagent. Grignard reagent slams into it, crashes it open. We get negative charge in the oxygen, which we stabilize with water again. Now we have an alcohol. But yet again, this is not useful to us. We saw that we wanted to form a carbon-to-carbon -carbon double bond, and in order to have that, we have to have two pieces, a ketone and a Wittig reagent. To get the ketone out of the alcohol, it's a secondary alcohol. The carbon that the OH is bonded to is bonded to one or two other carbons, so we can use a strong oxidizing agent like sodium dichromate and water and sulfuric acid. That turns the alcohol into a ketone, and then we just combine it with the appropriate Grignard reagent with the right carbon chain that we wanted. And poof, we have our product. So. That is a, a synthesis for this one. I guess we can write it out all in one step. If we start with the oxirane, at first, oops, at first we want to, let me make some room here. First thing we do is open it up with methyl magnesium bromide, as we saw. Remember that Me is a methyl group, CH3. It's going to act as a nucleophile here. Follow up your Grignard reagents with water, water wash. Stabilizes the negative oxygen. Then we oxidize that alcohol into an aldehyde using PCC, weak oxidizing agent, pyridinium chlorochromate. Once we had that, we could react it with our other Grignard reagent, ethyl magnesium bromide. It opens up, we stabilize the oxygen after every Grignard reagent with water. Oops. Whenever a Grignard reagent attacks a carbonyl. We stabilize that with water or an epoxide. Once you've got that stabilized, you oxidize it yet again, but at this point you have a secondary alcohol, so you can use a strong oxidizing agent like sodium dichromate in water and sulfuric acid, H2SO4. Now you have a ketone, and you just need the Wittig reagent, the appropriate Wittig reagent, a phosphorus bonded to three benzene rings. That's always in your Wittig reagent. The double bond is going to be to whatever carbon chain you want. The carbon chain we want has one bond to a hydrogen and another to a CH3. And that gave us our product. Those beautiful seven steps, like a painting, one layer at a time, gives us our masterpiece. So I'm going to stop the videos uh, for exercise 2042 here. There are two more exercises here, um, G and H. So I had G here. These, however, borrow reactions from the next chapter. So I may at some point make videos for those, but those will not be emphasized on this test. So G and H 
may or may not have videos. Um, either way, the reactions that they use are based, they bleed into the next chapter. They really borrow from the carboxylic acid chapter. And so I'm going to hold off. I think there's enough for you to, enough meat for you to chew before uh, we discuss that already in this chapter. So our next video uh, may be, the next video that will be relevant for this test will be spectroscopy.